Good morning, Naples Community Church family of ours. So happy you're here today in person. And hello to our online family. You know, when two or more gather, Holy Spirit's here, and I, I really feel it today. I'm going to be a little emotional. I didn't think I would, but my dad needs prayer. We all, well, a lot of you know Leo, and uh, he was rushed to the hospital last Sunday. He was doing pretty well, and he had a little downturn yesterday. So keep your prayers up. Thank you, prayer team. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, we haven't been able to see him, my sister and I, uh, because he has COVID, and uh, he just, he needs our prayer. He feels it. I tell him all the time that we're praying for him, and uh, he, he really, it really touches him. So we all know prayer works, and use that authority, and I, I thank you. Flowers today. Uh, some announcements, I'll just jump in. Flowers today are from me, although I asked for bright pink because that is my color. It was my birthday yesterday, so these were for me, but they're not quite as bright <laughs> as I wanted. <laughs> oh, well. I don't think it can be much brighter than this dress. So, um, And please, uh, cookies today, um, I believe. Um, who, who got the cookies today? I think it's just from the church because, what's that? It's a birthday cake, that's right, so no cookies. So please stay afterward. We do so much socializing and love giving before service and after service, it's there for you as well, so please share that. Um, love seeing everybody who's been here for years, months, days, weeks, and then the newcomers, I just love it. So love on each other as we always do. Ladies Luncheon, we have a number of uh, things to sign up for in the back, but just a couple of highlights. So Ladies Luncheon did change from Wednesday the 10th to Thursday the 11th, so keep that in mind. It's a bistro, La Baguette. Food Drive is going so well. Um, Julie, I think, is really pleased with our participation, and of course, St. Matthew's loves everything we do for them, as Pastor Kurt tells us um, about the great work that St. Matthew's is doing, so keep that up. Next Sunday, Bill Barnett is having the Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs concert. You do have to sign up. It is free, but space is limited. So we encourage you to go right away after service and sign up. Here's the, the flyer. You can find them in the back. Please sign up. Space is limited. And there's even, if you're not uh, online or a website, you know, savvy, please sign up in the back, and it will be taken care of for you to get a ticket for you. There's a little sign up in the back. Bible study on Monday with Dawn is noon and 6 p.m., both here in the Sunshine Room and by Zoom. Genesis, we're going through Genesis. It's Dawn is a wealth of information, and if I may, just highlight how amazing Dawn is sharing her gifts with the Bible studies, with her her love of Christ and her prayer for and her voice. Um, I would just like to thank you, Dawn, so much for blessing us each week. Bible study on Wednesday with Pastor Kurt is on Revelation, 4 p.m. here again in the Sunshine Room or by Zoom. Please take part in that. Such good discussions and issues hour. Wednesday, 11 a.m. We have a new sign up in the back. We have a women's organization called F3, which stands for Faith, Fellowship, and Fun. We are asking for your participation. Uh, we're collecting furnishings that will be utilized in one of the cottages for a woman and her children at a shelter. It's a great way for us to participate. Male or female, you can donate. And if you would rather donate in, uh, by check, Please see Kathy Latarte. Kathy, there she is. See Kathy, and she can give you more um, information about that. I thank you so much for prayer, um, and God bless you all in this church. I really appreciate you so much.
our opening. That truth abideth still, the way, the truth, and the life, and that is Jesus Christ. We are here to gather in his name here at Naples Community Church, in this public building and online. That is no little word that will fell all the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, principalities in heavenly wicked places but because of the spirit that Jesus himself said he would leave with his image bearers till he comes again we have the power and authority to walk through this very very crooked generation 
I invite your spirit to come here and be here in Naples Community Church. You know every one of our thoughts. You know every one of our things that are going on in each one of our lives. You know where our bodies are failing. You know where our finances are failing. You know where our hearts are troubled. You know where we are rejoicing. And while we are at a spiritual, supernatural conflict, by putting on that full armor of God that you've told us about in Ephesians, there is no weapon formed against us that will prosper. So I ask in this day, Heavenly Father, that you would give eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is able to listen and hear and learn from you in a, perhaps a fresh new understanding that we may have, so many of us have been in church for decades. Heavenly Father, I ask for a fresh wind and a fresh fire to fall on your people and my dear family at Naples Community Church. And I ask that, Father, that not only here, but also in all churches around where the name of Jesus is being lifted up. And we will give you all the praise and honor and glory. Amen. You may be seated, but I do ask that you would uh, sing along with us. If you know the words, it's pretty easy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my
Well, as we, as we go to prayer this morning, if you haven't figured it out already, this is Reformation Sunday. So we pull out Martin Luther and Amazing Grace and, and some of the, the great anthems of, of the church. But um, it's also All Saints Day for those who've got a Catholic background. And I think it's Halloween too. <laughs> so it's a uh, kind of a, one of those one of those days where it's like the constellation of stars where all the planets line up today. So this is a, a special day, but we, we celebrate the fact that um, men and women of courage have, have articulated the faith in the face of the religionizing of faith. And that's what was going on in the Catholic Church at that time. My dad always used to say, if only the Catholics had listened to Luther, we'd all be Catholics today. And in a sense, we are, because we're all part of the universal body of Christ. As we go to prayer, just a few items that I want to lift up. Uh, obviously, Leo Diamond, as we've just heard, and I didn't realize that he had taken a, uh, a little bit of a turn this week. And I tried to see him. I don't understand hospitals that don't allow a pastor in to see uh, their people. <clears throat> I've encountered this a couple times. One time I did, and they called security on me. I was, I was being nice, but uh, they still called secure. I, I just don't get some of this, this mindless response to, uh, to this pandemic. But please keep Leo in your prayers. And uh, Mary, we are grateful for your providing the flowers this morning and, and for your reminding us of your father's health. Also, we have a number of people who go through uh, times of chronic difficulty. And, um, you know, this morning, of course, Grace is with us after, after losing her husband, Ron, and we celebrated his life last weekend. But also we have um, Bev Hoagland, may not be known to many of you, but uh, we, we, uh, we had a service for Bill now about five years ago, and Bev is in memory care. And what a dear, dear couple they have been to the, in the life of our church, and she just is sustained on our, on our prayer list as one who we will probably not see at all unless we are, have an occasion to be there. But to keep people like Bev in our, in our prayers, Bruce and Dorsey as well have been at home for quite a while, uh, as has Donna Southern, who has an autoimmune system issue, and, and then Carol Summerfield, John's wife, who's been in memory care as well. These are dear people that, that um, in all likelihood, we, we will not or only rarely see. And then yesterday, I was with some other folks from our church, with uh, Mo and Margie, and um, uh, they were having a garage sale, and, and, and a number of us were doing the heavy lifting, putting stuff on trucks and that sort of thing. But they'll be, they'll be moving up to South Carolina pretty soon. So uh, please keep Mo and Margie in your prayers. As you know, Mo has congestive heart failure, and, and Margie has also had some autoimmune issues, and so it's really tough for them to be here. But just so that we don't forget those who are in a chronic situation of grief or loss or mental inc incapacity, these are people that are easy to forget, and we, we do our best when we remember these who are the least of our brothers and sisters. Let's, let's bow together in prayer. Oh, Father, on this Reformation Day, we, we are reminded that the faith in the hands of fallible human beings, when it gets institutionalized, when it gets associated with power, it also kind of wrecks our witness. Lord, may we, may we be aware that, that we, yes, we have the structures around our faith that allow us to put some flesh and blood to this which lacks that, that gives us a sense of, of continuation and participation in the larger church. So we have our symbols, we have our rituals, we have those things that we do. But Lord, ultimately, it's, 
It's all about a personal relationship that has been achieved for us by the gift of your son, by his life, his teaching, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and then his ingathering spirit, which continues to this day and will continue until, until the sun returns in glory. And Lord, that is our blessed hope. That we remain faithful in the midst of all circumstances and all times. And it just seems that, that the, the faith has been under some beleaguerment. Lord God, our faith is not to be downstream from culture. We're not to take our lead from what's going on in the cultural realm or in politics. We are not to be a shill for a particular political opinion. Instead, O oh Lord, we are to be regularly associated directly with you through, through prayer, through our reading of the scriptures, through fellowship in which we clarify and refine what it means to be followers of yours. Lord, it is this that keeps us downstream directly from your spirit. And that we might then be, be a remnant, that we might be the yeast in the loaf, that we might be the salt and the light in the world, that we might influence everything rather than simply being pushed about by every wind of doctrine. And so, Lord, I pray that you would keep us in that place where we are in regular, direct fellowship with you through your Son, through your Spirit, that we might be a people set apart. See, people set apart with the, the, the dominant command to love one another, to love our brothers and sisters. And Lord, in this way, we evince the reality of your life at work within us. Lord, we, we pray for the, the many hardships that are going on in our world. Lord, for what is going on in Sudan, our hearts break. For news that we are not hearing out of Afghanistan, but every now and then a, a voice comes out about Americans or those who worked with us being left behind. Lord God, for the many ways in which people struggle and suffer, the many ways in which they think that they're alone and they sink into despair. Oh, Father, this is your world. We know that, that it is in your hands that you over, oversee and superintend all things. So, Lord, we trust in you. Put our faith in you. And we thank you for the gift that is ours in Christ, the, the renewal of our lives and the hope of our souls. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise, even as we praise your son taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And as we are about to receive our offering, just a, a reminder that the, the work of St. Matthew's house has been frantically trying to distribute food because the, the need is great in our community. So if you have an occasion to bring it down to church, we welcome that, or just to put it on a check with a, or on the outside of that envelope reminding us that that's where you would like it to go, we will be more than happy to see that it goes there. Otherwise, it goes to the life of our church and the ministry that goes forth from this place. And so we bring to God our, our tithes and offerings.
Now, Father, use your word to open our eyes, open our hearts, our minds, our wills, our lives to serve you. Lord, may your Son, our Savior Christ, be enthroned in our hearts, and may we glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that video this morning was particularly, maybe I just do things for me. Maybe I'm such a narcissist, I do things that I like to do. <laughs> but um, it was at the Brandenburg Gate. My dad was there in the summer of 1945. And he told me about the wreckage of Berlin and, and yet how so many of the German people were so lovely and so nice to American GIs as, as they came in. But I was just reminded of what a horrific place that was. And then there were 200 bagpipers and, and this, this, this anthem of the Christian church, Amazing Grace, being sung. And I was just touched by that. So I hope you liked it, even though I liked it. <laughs> Our text this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John. And jo Jesus is still in Jerusalem during this fall celebration that is the Feast of Tabernacles. And he and his disciples are just making their way in the temple precincts and the disciples ask Jesus about a man they see who was blind. And somehow they figured out, maybe somebody spoke to them, but this man was born blind. So the disciples asked kind of a dumb question, and that is, who sinned that he was blind? His parents or, or him? <laughs> if he was born blind, I don't know how he could possibly sin, but it, he asked the question of Jesus, and Jesus said, neither, neither. These things occur so that God might be glorified. And so once again, Jesus goes to the dust, even as he did with that woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And he expectorates into the dust and stirs up a little pate of mud. And rubs it into his eyes and tells this blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he does, and this man can see. And he's walking around. People know him. And they see that he's now able to make his way around. No longer had, is he walking around with that stupid white cane. He's free. And so they decide that they need to bring him to the denominational authorities. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the Gospel of John. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them, he put mud over my eyes and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jewish, leader, Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see, so they called his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son, and yes, he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or, how, or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they left. 
He's old enough, ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Well, I don't know if he is a sinner or not, the man replied, but this I know. I was blind, and now I see. May God add his understanding to this hearing of his word. So here is a man born blind, healed, and despite all the so-called miraculous things that had gone on at, at that era and that period of time, no one had ever claimed to have been healed of blindness since birth. This is a once ever occurrence where this man born blind is now looking at the Pharisees and speaking to them. And what's fascinating about this is the Pharisees, these religious authorities, these ones who are in association with power, not just over the religious life of the community, but also in collaboration with Rome. They've got their own necks to look out for, and they claim this is all what is best for the people. So it's politics then, not unlike politics today. It's all politics when religion or faith is associated with power. And so they're going to make sure things go the way they determine it to be. And rather than recognizing with this man who's standing right before them, you can see? That's amazing. We are so happy for you. What was it like to all of a sudden see? How was it? We're so happy for you. Instead, there was just them arguing. This Jesus, how did he do it? <laughs> well, he, he made mud and put it on my eyes. It was on a Sabbath, right? Well, yeah. Well, then, he, he, he's in violation of the law. I mean, what on earth? And then there is a minority opinion there in, amongst the Pharisees, and that, that was probably people like Nicodemus and maybe Joseph of Arimathea. And they were saying, well, he can't be that bad if he can do these miraculous signs. Maybe this man really is one from God. Maybe this man, well, we can't convict him without a trial. Let's put it that way. So they bring him in, and they bring in the parents. They're trying to get some clarity on this issue because it's all just something that they cannot accept. They can't believe it. And so they're, they're doing everything they can to dismiss it. But this man who can see, this man who is blind from birth, let's guess at his age, let's say he's 20 years old, when they ask him point blank who he is, he says what he knows to say over against all that power that he sees arrayed before him. He is a prophet. He's one like Elijah, who healed Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria. He's a prophet like Elijah. This was not good. It's not good news. Not for the, those who were in power, those who were in charge of the denomination there in, in, in Jerusalem. They were looking, again, for some way of getting at Jesus. But the amazing thing is what he did not know he didn't know really who Jesus was. He didn't know if he was really a prophet. He didn't know what he was. But he said, what I do know is that I was blind. What I do know is now I see. Those words constitute the reality of conversion. 
He was one thing and now he's something very different. He was in darkness and now he is in light. And the discourse goes on where Jesus is called in and he declares that those who are in charge, those who are in power are the really, really the truly blind ones. And all this does is stir them up even more because they think they're so smart. But Jesus declares them blind, as does this man who says that Jesus did this. So being made new, having eyes opened, being able to see which they couldn't, he couldn't do before or as people can't before. A remarkable story of Martin Luther is one in which he was going to law school, he was heading into, heading into uh, law school and he encountered on horseback a brutal thunderstorm and a lightning strike hit so close to him it almost killed him and it blew him off of his horse. And coming off of that, he was so terrified that he, he promised God that he would go into, he would go into the, the, the monkery. He would become a monk of the church. And so he, he became a monk. He went to a monastery. And he became so serious about what it meant to be a, a, a monk in the church. He began a process of denying himself any comforts whatsoever as a way of trying to do what he could to purge himself of his sin. He literally became a flagellant. He would, he would beat himself and, 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 and cry out in pain because of his sin. He would, he would sleep at night or he couldn't sleep at night because he would put no clothing on and he would freeze at night as a way of sort of demonstrating his repentance for his sin. And he, he went on and on he, he, and he was doing everything he could to try, to try to become worthy of the grace of God. And he couldn't. And, and he was miserable. But he believed that that's what God wanted. God wanted him to purge himself of this sin that beset him. And then in the midst of it, he began to, he began to read the scriptures. And he focused on the gospel, pardon me, on the book of Romans, the, the Apostle Paul's book of Romans, and particularly the third chapter. And he, he fixed on the words, not by works, but by faith, not by anything I do, but by faith. This is when the Catholic Church had gone hard into institutionalism. There's a guy named John Tetzel who was selling what was called indulgences. If you bought indulgences, you could spring your loved ones out of purgatory into heaven. And this was a way of doing some stuff down in the Vatican. And, and it was a, it was a brutal understanding of the church's control of people, as if the church was the, the way that one could find peace with God, as if by taking the sacraments and paying money to the church, you could receive salvation. But when Luther began to think about what it meant to serve the church and then what it meant to read the scriptures, he became well, he began to change. And he began to think about this. And they made him a teacher, a professor at the University of Wittenberg. And he began, he began speaking and, and talking more and more about this reality of grace. And finally, he drafted his 95 tweets that he sent out to all of the Roman Empire, and particularly on the Wittenberg door. 95 arguments that basically started something that he had no intention of starting. But there was a ferment in the church and the, and the people, the people connected with what he was saying. 
Because a church like the Temple of Jerusalem in the first century, as a religious organization, had become so oppressive, so powerfully hurtful of actual people in real life that they began to, they began to follow what Luther was saying. And at the same time, the Bible was now being translated into German so people could read it for themselves and they could see for themselves the truth of what Luther was saying. So finally, he said, at last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the, right, the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the, through the gates that had been flung open. He was converted. He was blind and he could see. He felt he was transformed directly into the kingdom of heaven with this with this wonderful recognition, this, this joyful reality of being made new. And everything changed for him. It's kind of funny. He talks about the morning after his wedding day, being shocked, waking up, and seeing pigtails on the pillow next to him. For a priest, that would be a shocking thing. <laughs> and so he started life anew. And around Luther, then were other reformers, and the entire church went into upheaval. And so here we are today. In no small manner, a legacy of what God did in one man's life, what God does in life after life after life, what the Lord does to open eyes so that we can see. And the crazy thing about it is it's not, it's not opinion. It's not something that we can achieve. It's not something that we can argue our way into or out of. There is an actual change that happens that is not a part of any kind of discourse other than something happens. And just as the blind man and his parents went in with a bunch of question marks as to what it was that had happened, so it is with us. Somehow we just don't know. So I was doing youth ministry. My very first call out of seminary, the Laverne Heights Presbyterian Church. And we went up to Forest Home Christian Conference Center. We had about 25 kids. And it's <clears throat> like youth ministry in Southern California, just wild, crazy, stupid fun. Loud music and, and uh, speakers that tell more jokes than anything. And it's, it's just fun. And, you know, kids are, kids are falling in love with kids from other schools. And all, it's just all this chaotic stuff of, of a week of summer camp. And, and I, had, I had one kid with me um, of the 25 who was one of those particularly troublesome kids. And um, he was always in trouble at school. And when he would come to the youth, youth group, he would sit in the back and he was always just kind of goofing around in the back. There was always something going on. And one night we had an overnight in, in the house next to the uh, church and this kid in particular, I had to yank him out of a sleeping bag with, a, with a, one of the girls. And um, he, he was just one of those kind of kids. But he came up to me after camp and he said, he said, Kurt, something's happened. I said, are you okay? He said, he said, Some, he said something's happened. And I said, 
well, what happened? He said, in my heart. And I don't really know what it is. But I want you to baptize me. So before we left, we went out to Lake Mears, named after Henrietta Mears. And with all those kids, we're standing in the lake. And I took this young man. I didn't know how to do this. I was a Presbyterian, you know. We, you know, we, we usually do the water thing, a little water on the head. So I just, I just said, Jack, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. And I lowered him down and pulled him back up. All the kids applauded. And he wept. His face was wet, but I could see the redness of his eyes as he wept. And the wetness of his eyes said to me what he didn't have words to say. And that was, I was blind, and now I see. I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but kids in the ministry, in the ministry today dramatically changed. I follow him. Every now and then I'll see him, the pages of his church. And no explanation. I don't know if it was what the speaker said or what happened in the cabin or where it was or how it was, but somehow Jesus himself opened his eyes, opened his heart, and opened his will. That's faith. And we do our best when we don't domesticate it. Certainly when we dissociate our faith with whatever is going on in the culture, again, the faith is to be upstream, not downstream from culture. And that we are always to be a people who are defined, not by the stuff around us, by the, but by the indwelling reality of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Will you join me in prayer? And so, Lord, and we don't know. We don't know how change happens. Sometimes we try, we try real hard. But somehow we can't quite pull it off. And then something happens. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, for making us new. Thank you for your Son, our Savior Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me for our closing hymn?
So there will be bright shining as the sun, filled with the glory of our Lord. And that hope, go in peace and live by faith. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and in the life everlasting. Amen. And before we go, it is birthday week. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Annie Blake, Sandy, Glenna, Jack, Steve, Ron, Gracie, Nancy, Joanne, Helga, Ralph, Pat, Karna, Ken, Lorraine, Gloria, Barbara, Yvonne, Mike, Jim, and Mary. Happy birthday to you.